And today's workshop is devoted uh, to a stakeholder's perspective on safe and sustainable by design. And I give you now the word to Professor Andrew Nelson from the University of Leeds. Probably all of you, you already know Andrew, um, he's a professor and faculty of engineering at the University of Leeds. He's the mastermind initiator of a project. <laughs> Andrew, you have the floor. Oh, hello everybody. <clears throat> okay, thank, hi everybody. And we're really happy to have you all come here. It's just incredible how many people are coming to our wonderful workshop, which I'm sure you'll really enjoy today and find a lot, uh, find it very productive and useful. Uh, first of all, let's thank Beatrice Alfaro from uh, BioNanonet for organizing this workshop. I want to publicly thank Beatrice because I know she's worked enormously hard to put this all together and she's worked with my uh, colleague uh, Karen Steenson amongst other people. Secondly, thanks to all speakers who have from whom we're going to hear really interesting and varied talks this morning. And in the next three minutes, I'm going to give you a few introductory words about safety and sustainable by design uh, a paradigm. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the aim of a Sabadoma, which is the project uh, I'm coordinating, is to directly couple screening to the production of nanomaterials and also the release products from nanomaterials. And the whole principle is to use the uh, screening results to actually modify both the production of nanomaterials and uh, the composition of the coatings. And you can see a picture very generic generic picture where on the top of the diagram we have production or release and on the bottom of the diagram we have a flow uh, going into the screening and producing results and the whole thing is online. On the right top diagram we have a specific example of our online production unit of nanomaterials, everything online and uh, from the uh, output, it's going into the screening system, which you can see in the bottom left, which is then providing results to modify the design of the materials. Secondly, I should say that sustainability is actually implicit in Sabadoma, because the whole principle of Sabadoma is to have everything in a circular configuration. It's uh, actually a control system and uh, an online micro design. We try to make things as small as possible and that is actually implicit in the Sabadoma project. So we at Sabadoma are also very much environmentalists and this principle that you can see above the circular system where uh, results from production are fed back to design. You can actually use in pollution control, environmental pollution control. You can use it uh, interestingly in the control of epidemics. It's the actual philosophy of that circular uh, configuration. So sustainability is built into the whole thing. You can also use it to uh, control carbon dioxide emissions when we're talking about climate change. So it has a generic global applicability. Sabadoma is therefore contributing to this hot topic area by gathering different opinions from uh, sustainability and safety by design from respective stakeholder communities, from academia, industry and NGOs. And that's what we're going to hear about today. And finally, and I didn't thank Anthony Beauchamp for his uh, very generous and commending introduction to my introductory words. And let's sit back and enjoy the show.
Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, for these very <laughs> welcome uh, warm words. Um, myself, uh, I will be presenting, in, just in a nutshell, the um, outcome of the first legal workshop, which was organized on the 28th of January last year, uh, in the context of a project. Um, the first legal workshop uh, was uh, devoted to uh, the study of uh, the regulatory aspects of safe uh, and even sustainable by design. In the context of a project, we have two workshops. The first one already took place and a second one will take place next year in the last uh, semester of the project. And it will uh, be focused on the broader legal aspects of um, the safe and sustainable by design concepts. Um, namely insurance, liability, and also advanced regulatory topics. Uh, the first legal workshop was based uh, both on interdisciplinarity and on a comparative law approach. Uh, that means that we had not only lawyers uh, speaking at this first legal workshop, but we also had uh, scientists, philosophers, um, who were involved, and policymakers also, who were involved in um, the workshop uh, different presentations. We had also a comparative law approach because we compared um, the European uh, Union legal system with the Asian perspective, um, and that is to say more than half of the world was, was covered in terms of legal systems. Uh, the audience included different stakeholders. We had scientists, industry representatives, lawyers, regulators, compliance officers, uh, also members and representatives of NGOs. It was a very diverse audience and that was really um, an achievement because the purpose was to not only speak uh, about legal aspects with um, policy makers or lawyers, but also understand what was what were what are the insights of uh, other stakeholders like scientists next slide please thank you um we identified that there are discrepancies between uh, regulatory approaches uh, of nanomaterial in different regions of the world in asia uh, currently we have um, a very fragmented legal framework um, and that was uh, highlighted by uh, Professor Mohamed Ershadul Karim uh, from the University of Malai. Um, and in the European Union, we have uh, the most advanced uh, legal system concerning uh, the safety aspects of nanomaterials. When we say the most advanced systems, it doesn't mean that everything is fully covered or that uh, it is 100% satisfactory. But uh, on the other hand, we come to the conclusion that the legal aspects we are the most familiar with in European projects like SEBAIDOMA are of course the most advanced in the world and therefore they are like a benchmark for other legal systems. Uh, we also discussed in this first legal workshop uh, about the rise of by design approaches in different regulatory fields uh, that was specifically highlighted by Dr. Mirala Mitinen for the University of Eastern Finland. Um, she discussed about the pharma, chemicals and personal data protection by design principles um, and she even drafted a paper published um, in uh, the European Journal of Risk and Regulation uh, in 2020. Um, we also took the example of the no well-established privacy by design approach and uh, Professor Ira Rubinstein from the University of New York um, openly discussed about the background and also the flows of such principle. Um, a principle that is deeply rooted in the evolution of uh, privacy in interesting technologies. What is interesting about the privacy by design principle is that it, today in the European Union we have the GDPR. You are probably all, all of you already heard about this famous regulation uh, protecting personal data. And we have a principle about privacy by design that is enshrined in the regulation. So it serves as an example that we have a regulation um, fully enforced um, that all companies, um, institutions have to comply with where we have a by design approach. It protects here privacy, 
not the safeness or uh, safety uh, of and sustainability of nanomaterials, but that is an interesting point, and we can compare that uh, with the approach we're discussing about in a project like ours. Um, it entails only, of course, an obligation of means, not results. So uh, there are, of course, um, certain uh, aspects to be taken into account um, about the judiciary interpretation also. Um, it is, of course, uh, very interesting in terms of guidance. Um, it, it raises the question of the availability of technologies. If you don't have privacy enhancing technologies that fully comply with the data uh, with the privacy by design principle, of course, um, it means that the principle has no real purpose. So, of course, there is a deep link between technologies and a legal principle. Next slide, please. At the end of the first legal workshop, we also had a round table, um, which included speakers uh, who were all skilled in different disciplines, philosophy of science, uh, ecotoxicology, risk management, and law. Uh, the round table was very interesting in the sense that we had speakers uh, whose experience background is very different, but they all converged in the same direction. That is to say, that uh, there could not be a legal definition of safe by design without taking into account the risk acceptance level of any society. And the question of resilience was particularly highlighted uh, by Dr. Igor Linkov, um, who, uh, was, who is the author of a very esteemed and uh, authoritative book on uh, resilience and risk and resilience, published by Springer in 2019. Uh, such principle uh, of course, like safe and sustainable by design can be established, but uh, we need tools. And um, in particular, uh, Ignazi uh, Gispert um, highlighted that decision making roadmaps uh, could help with the implementation of safe by design approaches. And that is a very new and original approach to uh, give tools. Uh, to uh, the addresses of a potential legal principle uh, uh, of safe by design. And um, Ignazi also alighted um, something that is completely hidden in the current literature is the link between safe by design and the precautionary principle, which is protected by international treaties and also even the uh, treaty on the functioning of the European Union. So it means that we have a very strong uh, principle recognized by our legal systems and in fact we can establish a link between this principle uh, and of course the safe by design approach that is to say just in a nutshell what we covered in the first legal workshop we have here a, a very good basis uh, for future developments in the project and also a discussion uh, just beyond and uh, with a broader audience uh, than the participants to a project Thank you very much. And I now give the floor to uh, Beatrice Alfaro, who is um, a, originally a telecommunications engineer, specialized in telematic. And uh, as Andrew highlighted, uh, she is a, a researcher at BioNanonet in Austria. Beatrice, you have the floor. Hi, good morning, everybody. Now we continue with the next. Uh, part of the workshop and with our external speakers um, talking about their opinions on safe and sustainable by design. You have received in the last couple of days um, the definitions and visions that these uh, persons have about safe and sustainable by design. After the presentations of all the speakers, we could go through an online survey so that we can uh, see which is your opinion or which are your favorite, favorites regarding safe and sustainable by design. But now let's um, hear what they have to say about safe and sustainable by design. Our experts, experts today will be uh, representing academia, Victor Puntes from Applied Nanoparticles in Spain, Mario Pancera from the University of Vigo, in Spain also, and Eva Balsami Jones from the University of Birmingham in United Kingdom. Then we will have 
um, Denis Sarikianis from um, and representing the Park Project and starting Horizon Europe Project. Jana Durvolabova uh, representing the European Commission. Genia Tria representing the European Environmental Agency. And Chloe Devik uh, representing CEFIC. Henrique Dean from Kemsec. Blanca Suarez from Tema Solutions in Switzerland. And finally, uh, Jean Kelly from Nanotechnology Industries Association. Now um, it's the turn from, of uh, Victor Puntes, as I said, from Applied Nanoparticles in Spain. He's a research professor at ICREA. This is the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies in Spain. He works on the synthesis, characterization, and applications of engineered inorganic nanoparticles. Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, hope you can hear me properly. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's nice to, uh, <laughs> would be much nicer if that was a real meeting. Um, but it's very comfortable on the screen. Um, I think I'm representing an uh, industry as applying nanoparticles. I would say that I've made more work for uh, safety by design in the company than in the academia, but that's irrelevant for the contents of the talk. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer, indeed, with a PhD in physics, and I got into the nano safety and nano sustainability because I was spending many hours in a lab uh, producing nanoparticles with many people, young people making nanoparticles. And uh, I was concerned and I could not uh, wait for regulation to arrive because it would be too late if nanoparticles were toxic. And when thinking of toxic and safety, uh, I think safety and sustainability is the same thing. I hope one day all the people will understand that. So uh, the health of the environment is our health directly and uh, sustainability is kind of health on the long term and safety is the health on the short term. So when all this started and we were worried about uh, potential noxious effects of uh, nanomaterials in people at uh, early 2000, uh, papers on carbon nanotubes, uh, Vicky Coving on uh, potential particles toxicity, not being a biologist, a toxicologist, was difficult uh, to um, to understand uh, what was doing the nanoparticles to biological systems, but we could know what the particles were doing when these things happen. It's like uh, if you want to study, uh, uh, let me the analogy uh, briefly, if you want to study uh, toxicity of cars, if you have an accident with a car and it's a Mercedes, then you, would, you can say Mercedes are toxic. But then when we look closer, we see that the driver was drunk, that the brakes were broken that the uh, speed was too fast. So it was not the car, the toxicity related to, but was what the car was doing at that moment or the driver. And then we look at the full life, uh, life of the nanoparticles. Of course, safety and sustainability without full life cycle is absurd. Okay, it shouldn't be considered. Puntual safety or puntual sustainability, like electric cars are not uh, sustainable because you have to produce the electricity somewhere else. But uh, we were looking how nanoparticles uh, behave in the cases where they are from toxic or not toxic. And then more or less what we found is a uh, next slide, please. is a series of uh, parameters where we are determining the outcome of the interaction between the nanoparticles and the uh, biological systems. Many of them could be extrinsic to the nanoparticle that was pollution and endotoxin contamination. Um, rest from the synthesis, ions from the synthesis who were not uh, properly purified, another type of pollutions. Aggregation, aggregation of nanoparticles, we take them from the nano regime to the micro regime, that was always associated with toxicity, regardless of the material and the surface state and everything. The surface state was determining the, um, the aggregation at the end, uh, who was the, uh, the causing uh, of toxicity. And then we could uh, uh, discriminate between uh, features who were intrinsic to the nanoparticle and extrinsic to the nanoparticle and see how they uh, can be uh, can affect toxicity. And then uh, we were participating in European projects with some of you in this in this uh, meeting uh, in the nano European nano safety cluster, reading any paper we could find on about nanoparticles doing good or bad things, and then always checking about how the nanoparticles were uh, 
where the state of the nanoparticles at the moment of the toxicity, how they were um, uh, presented to the biological system, biodistribution, corrosion, uh, protein uh, corona formation, uh, association with toxic moieties or not, dispersion, and all that more or less led us to make uh, a series of uh, a kind of a selection rules. Next slide, please. Where I think uh, we can uh, more or less predict uh, what causes uh, toxicity, so you should prevent these things to happen and it's not very difficult if I go very fast. Uh, toxic things are toxic in their nanoform, in the same way that the nanoform is not uh, creating an extra toxicity normally. Uh, by standards and pollutants are responsible for toxicity of your sample full of nanoparticles. Cationic charges as, as antimicrobial peptides, uh, cationic things are not very often present in nature. Oxygen 20% in the atmosphere uh, led to oxidated surface, normally a negative surface. And in the body, everything is negative and negatively charged. And then we have the sodium and the potassium to counterbalance. Hydrophobicity, not very good. Detergents, not very good. Uh, anything with amphipathic, not very good. Aggregation. Uh, frustrated phagocytosis or not aggregation also uh, is toxic. Uh, presentation of antigens or allergens, we would like to make videos like particles. Uh, chemical transformation, release of toxic ions from the nanoparticles, like cadmium, cadmium nanoparticles, we are not toxic until they corrode and release the cadmium, and then you have a different profile of exposure of the biological system to the toxic ions. Photocatalysis, we can use to fry uh, tumoral cells, also can induce uh, an, an unwanted reactivity. And uh, this is related to absorption, uh, radiation absorption, if you have an implant, uh, if you have um, a, a peacemaker and you are in a magnetic field, if you have magnetic nanoparticles in a magnetic field, they have hot. It's also used for uh, hyperthermia, tumoral ablation, but that could be toxic. And then, in principle of that, if you avoid that during the full life cycle of the particle, this is happening, you should be really safe by now. And that's our approach to nano safety by design, which also includes nano sustainability by design. And thank you. Thanks, Victor, for your nice presentation. And now we welcome Mario Pancera from the University of Vigo in Spain. His work, in, um, his work is focused on responsible research and innovation and innovation for the growth and post growth. The floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, I don't have slides, um, so bear, bear with me and my Italian Spanish accent. Okay, so I originally have a, a background in telecommunication engineering. I major in physics, but now my, my work is mainly focused on soci sociology of technology. So this will be my perspective on, uh, on the topic of uh, safe and sustainability by design. When I was invited to, to give my opinion on this, uh, the first uh, thing that I've done is, uh, of course, Googling. And um, the first things that appears uh, at least in my, my browser, when, uh, when I type safe and sustainable by design, it was a slogan. And the slogan really struck me because the slogan is boosting innovation and growth within the European chemical industry. And I, I would like to uh, do some, a couple of comments on, on this slogan. Uh, but first, uh, I, I want also to, to tell you uh, the second uh, results in Google. The second result in Google was a very nice diagram that they resemble what's a, a circular economy, uh, like like in a very very similar fashion to circular economy. So you have like this circle, in which uh, there are uh, basically three major areas. The first one is the econ economy, economy, economics, and economy. The second one is the the need to 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 develop. Uh, technology that are aligned with environmental goals, and the third part is uh, is a society. No, and this is the the typical um, structure of uh, what is called the triple bottom line approach. No, that we have the environment, society, economy that are all at the same level. And of course, this this way of presenting safe and sustainability by design uh, also struck me. Because actually, what we know uh, is uh, this triple bottom line is very limited, and actually, I would say, I would dare to say that it's not true, because from other fields like ecological economics, we know that the economy is a subsystem of society, that is a subsystem of the environment. So these three uh, legs, these three, uh, three pillars, cannot be at the same level. Uh, and, and of course they don't have the same level of importance because any economic activity is a material based. 
preservation of the ecosystem uh, is, is first. So, so we, we first need to preserve the, the, the environment, then we can build a society, then we can build uh, a society that is possibly just to uh, e the economy. Um, so, I, and, and I would also add that the economy must serve society and, and the environment. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it, I think it's presenting safe, safe and sustainable by the side in this way in which you have a nice circle in which these three pillars are the same level is quite limited. Uh, so in this sense, my personal opinion from a very, uh, let's say, from, from just having an overview of what safe and sustainable by design is at least in how it's present in the, in the literature and in this course of the European Union, is just an uh, old wine in a new bottle. And I will explain very quickly because we don't have a lot of time by focusing on two aspects. The first one is what is wrong with this slogan uh, um, boosting innovation and growth within the European chemical industry. And the second aspect is what is, what is missing in safe and sustainability by design, at least in, in the way it's presented now. So I will start with growth. I think, and I think that this is very strong and harsh claim that we don't need to foster growth. Rather the opposite. We know that the economic growth after a certain point become totally anti-economic. It means that it uh, damages, uh, it creates, overcome its benefits. And there is a wide consensus, we don't have time to discuss this, but there is a wide consensus that the GDP growth and energy and material consumption and also CO2 emission are almost linearly correlated. It means that economic growth equals environmental destruction and degradation. At the least in the industrialized, industrialized country, we need to reduce industrial production and not to increase it. So if you think that the safe and sustainable by design approach should deliver more growth, I think you are totally wrong. I'm sorry about that. We need less chemical in the environment, not more chemical. Because this, is, this would be the ideal situation to reach a, a minimum sustainable environment. So in my opinion, any safe and sustainable by design strategy should include a post-growth strategy to be credible. So how we reset industrial uh, society in a way that is no longer producing economic growth. At the same time, it's producing well-being. My second point is about this obsession with boosting innovation. This is the, se the second point in the slogan. Every more innovation doesn't make any sense if you don't know why we need innovation in the first place and what kind of innovation we want. Do we need, we, do we really need nanotechnology? What are the alternatives there? Okay. This brings me to the second criticism that is about what is missing in the SSBD. We know that innovation is not neutral from the philosophy of science and sociology of technology. It's not apolitical. The contrary is true. Innovation is always the result of values and purposes of its creator and always to the example of driver's car of Google. Uh, the Google driver's car were unable to recognize black people in streets during the first test this is because the programmer only used uh, white faces in training the uh, facial, facial recognition algorithm because they were, they were white. So as, as a result, a group of people are, can be discriminate, discriminated uh, because the technological development is a bias is imbe embedded. And this uh, is happening all the time. So the driverless car is just an example. And, and this is why innovation has the power for creating future. And this is for me, this is very important point. It can change people's life, but this future can be very diverse and will uh, reflect the values and worldviews of innovators. So if we are a white man uh, living in the North, you will imagine a certain future that will be, will be based on your values and interests. Maybe this interest can be totally opposed to the interests of, of, and values of other people, another group. So where are these reflections about the kind of society we want to build in the safe and sustainable by design? framework, how values and purposes are discussed and embed embedded in this model, how uncertainty is managed. This is the kind of question that the four dimension of responsible innovation try to address, no? We, and, and then I quickly conclude. Uh, this dimension are, of course, reflecting about why we innovate, anticipate, so what can possibly go, go wrong, uh, inclusion, listening to different voices, not only scientists and experts, but also lay, lay people. Uh, and respond. So to be responsive, how can we change innovation direct direction 
uh, through this process of uh, uh, engaging, reflecting, anticipating. And I think that the safe and sustainable by design framework lack, lacks this four dimension. Uh, and, and without this kind of reflection, the risk is that uh, SSBD will reproduce business as usual, will be functional to the status quo that we know is, is unsustainable. The risk is that uh, this framework can be another form of more sophisticated greenwashing. And uh, I think that we are in the middle of the climate crisis and environmental crisis. We don't need more uh, greenwashing. We need to sit down, discuss together how we can redirect innovation to serve people's needs, not to boost industrial production and economic growth. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mario, for your vision and sharing with us your ideas. Then we continue now uh, with Eva Balsami Jones, uh, who is a professor of environmental science and nanoscience at the University of Birmingham in um, United Kingdom. Her research interests focus on understanding reactivity at the nanoscale, particularly interactions of nanoparticles with pollutants and biota and biomineralization processes. Please. Eva. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for uh, introducing me. Thanks to the um, organizers for, for inviting me. I, I'm, of course, I'm one of the internal people, let, let's say, but also I hope to, to, to give a scientist perspective. Um, I also, uh, I think others before me also said, when you're invited to, to, to give such a um, big scale um, vision, you, you always think, where, where do I start? And, and am, am I am the most qualified person to, to give this opinion? Um, so I thought I will, I, and, and also of course, there are so many other amazing speakers um, with us today, perhaps infinitely more qualified to speak about what safe and sustainable by design actually means. So I thought I'll take a slightly different angle um, uh, just for all audience entertainment also and, and, and give a perspective of not what safe and sustainable by design might be, although of course I have my opinion and of course I'll share that with you, but uh, and, and also not how we um, deliver it, but, but more about who is perhaps best positioned to, to, to deliver or to underpin such uh, you know, big scale, big vision um, uh, undertaking. Um, and with that, maybe I'll, I'll move to my next slide, please, Beatrice. So I said I will say my, my, my thoughts on what I think is safe and sustainable. So in terms of, of safety um, and starting from, from a more a ground where I feel more comfortable because I've been working on the safety of nanomaterials for, for quite a long time. I would say that the, the key aspect here is, uh, of course, minimizing the risk of, of, of harm from any materials uh, we produce. Um, um, in our research, uh, in recent years, it's been nanomaterials, but we, we've already seen um, the new kids on the block come in, the advanced materials, and perhaps who knows what else, uh, of course, smart materials as well. So it's it's actually minimizing any, any um, risk to humans and to the environment from from these materials and importantly uh, we can't minimize anything without actually understanding what it is that brings the hazard so to me these are the the, the, the center points of, of a definition of of safe and sustainable of safe by design sorry now going into sustainable and this is where i feel a little bit in shaky ground this is new to many of us nano safety experts so so to speak about ourselves but um with my earth sciences background uh, hard on, I would say that the very first thing for me is uh, the, the, the ethical use of resources, ethical and, and, and considerate. Um, we could have the, the safest materials on the planet, but if, if, the, if the components that generate them come from places they shouldn't come either because of, of ethics, because of war zones, because of, um, of, of minimizing resources. Um, one thing that you know as an earth scientist is that the resources on our planet are finite. Um, some of the commonest resources, think for example phosphorus, we all uh, take phosphorus in through food every single 
day of our life and multiple times during a day, yet the raw material exists in very few and not necessarily um, best positioned um, um, minds uh, to, 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 be, uh, to, be, to, to be taken from. Um, these minds are in sensitive areas and also they have very finite um, amount of phosphorus left. So here we go, um, a, a something that we, we use all the time without even thinking when we drink our Coca-Cola, which is plenty, which contains tons of phosphorus and yet it's a finite resource, we have to use it ethically. Again, um, the other aspect of course is however we, we take our resources, the operations have to be sensitive and respect society and respect the environment. And these are my, um, the ring fence primary components of what I would have said is safe and sustainable by design. Um, moving on, thank you Beatrice, like, we'll take the next slide please. I'm conscious of my time. I'll say a few things. First of all, about the nano safety cluster. Perhaps um, I don't need to say too much, but I, I said in my introduction, I will say who I think is best qualified to um, to work on this new um, um, challenge, safe and sustainable by design. And I think this is us. This is the nano safety cluster, who's already proved its um, focus, desire, worth in terms of solving problems um, in nano safety and can take now the extra challenge of sustainability. Could I have my next slide please Beatrice? Thank you. I also provided this paper for as my, my reading advice um, and uh, here I will not say too much about the paper. People of course can read it. I just wanted to remind it to you. Maybe I'll have the next slide please Beatrice. Um, I just wanted to to, to summarize the key messages from, from this paper, which of course is that the nano safety cluster has been around solving problems for quite a few years. We, we now understand so much better uh, what makes materials um, toxic, nanomaterials toxic. We now um, have an, a much better analytical capability, computational capacity. We've solved many problems. So we have the precedence to show that we are in a position to, to tackle safe and sustainable. Um, we have the confidence, we have the breakthroughs. I think the other two key components that we mustn't forget is how important to work in an interdisciplinary way. And I think that was a key success of the nano safety cluster. And I would like to finally, finally emphasize internationalization because we're all on one planet, we all share it, we all share knowledge and expertise. If we learn something from the pandemic is that we should be working across the globe um, together to solve problems like that. And that's me finished. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Eva. And now we continue with Denis Sarikianis who is a professor of environmental engineering at the School of Chemical Engineering in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. His main research areas are chemical hazard and risk assessment, environment and health, industry ecology and advanced technologies of environmental pollution monitoring and management, and for human exposure assessment to environmental chemicals. Uh, Dennis is a partner in the upcoming PARC project who, uh, what is a new Horizon Europe partnership initiative starting in May 2022 with around 200 partners. Uh, BARC will establish an European-wide research and innovation risk assessment hub of, of excellence uh, to support the DAU and uh, national chemical risk assessment and risk management authorities to address current emerging and novel chemical safety challenges and enable, of course, the transition to the next generation risk assessment. Thanks, Dennis, for being here. And now, please. Thank you so much, uh, Beatrice, for the uh, very kind invitation. Uh, it really is a pleasure because, indeed, uh, this project, and uh, I agree with Eva, all the nano safety cluster projects actually uh, have been doing a tremendous work to support, well, to promote, actually, safe by design. Uh, and um, so it is a, a, very, a great forum to discuss SSBD you now, uh, and not just uh, SBD. Um, SSBD, Safe and Sustainable by Design, uh, Chemicals, Products and Materials, uh, 
are a key component of the uh, chemical strategy for sustainability, of course, but also the park project. Um, it is a uh, large part of uh, the, its most innovative, let's say, um, work uh, uh, on uh, new concepts and uh, platforms uh, is dedicated to um, SSBD. And indeed, indeed, uh, we're trying to, um, uh, to to already prepare the work uh, that is starting in, in uh, technically in April or May, uh, but which will actually continue uh, since the last year and a half, uh, trying to, to be fast in terms of uh, providing input to the overall uh, EU uh, process. Um, so um, let's go back in the you know in the interest of time directly to the question of the criteria for uh, or you know what's the vision for SSBD in the context of park uh, and uh, indeed of course the question if we, if we want to split safe and sustainability by design so safe by design criteria should actually uh, be based on the coordinated effort to safeguard both human health and uh, environmental uh, health and uh, sort of uh, protection from environmental hazards uh, uh, whereas, but at the same time, they need to ensure that uh, aiming at these goals, we do not move against major sustainability goals. And uh, that includes, of course, a number of environmental dimensions, minimizing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, minimizing environmental pollution, maximizing efficiency in resource use, so not offsetting uh, intergenerational equity in terms of resource availability. Uh, but also, uh, and I, I'd like to point out here that uh, what Eva said is very, very relevant with regard to the ethical component of use of resources uh, and of course okay I mean, we could have a discussion on the more philosophical underpinning of uh, all these uh, dimensions as uh, mentioned by Mario it's a good discussion um, the sustainability by design um, the facet actually should also foster circularity which is of course a key feature of the green deal um, and uh, it is very important to identify that uh, SSBD principles uh, have to be respected to, during the over overall lifetime of the of products, materials, and chemicals, accounting for the, their overall uh, whole life cycle. Uh, in this context, the idea is to, to pay particular attention to the holistic design of systems. So we're not just talking about chemicals, products, materials, but actually of the overall system, because processes for producing and, and, and using are key to that. Uh, the adoption of life cycle thinking is fundamental in this context. And of course, uh, this, this also means that uh, we need to be able to uh, avoid design practices and solutions that cause burden shifting to other domains. So let's say from one thematic area to the other, from health to climate change and vice versa, to uh, from water to sludge, from water to soil uh, or air. So it is a question of really trying to, to uh, have a more uh, integrative approach uh, and uh, one thing that uh, I was not, uh, I did not put on the slide, but it is very important. I think you also passed upon it in the discussion before. Is the question of time. Uh, the temporal dimension is is one that actually transcends uh, both the safety concern in this case, in this context, and in particular the sustainability concern, um, because in that context, uh, uh, indeed, if we if we need to think about uh, how time modulates both exposure and uh, indeed vulnerability of people and of the environment to, to, to chemical pressures, let's put it in general terms. Uh, but it also um, takes, it, it takes a, a big toll to the overall sustainability of processes and products in terms of uh, availability, availability of resources or uh, use of uh, space or even uh, reuse of uh, quote unquote waste. I'm saying quote unquote because waste in, in a secular uh, concept of course is part of the overall uh, resource base. Um, if we can move to the next slide, I think um, we actually uh, pinpoint to, the to what we are going to do in uh, in park. I think that's useful. Uh, so this is a seven-year project, and um, which actually allows us uh, the room for gives us the room to a stepwise of process implementation of the criteria that are currently being developed by the European Commission. Um, so the idea is to have a, a recommendation or a guideline uh, document uh, uh, as a starting point to be delivered within the first three years. Uh, in terms of how to apply the criteria. Using this, the idea is, of course, and, and of course, based on that, we could focus on the development of a, a sort of a certification scheme for chemicals, materials, and products that uh, are SSBD approved. Uh, but obviously, uh, we have the room, and, and I think this is the key priority at this point, from the technical point of view, to, to develop a, a, a technical support system um, that would allow all the stakeholders to comply with the certification scheme, both uh, 
the private sector, of course, and the public sector as in terms of assessment. So it's an SSDD toolbox to support the application of the evaluation criteria to aim directly to the successful implementation of the certification scheme. Um, this, of course, would be used to describe methods with which critical properties of materials, chemi of chemicals, materials and products, but also of packaging or application processes of manufacturing processes can be identified from early stage of, from at an early uh, stage of innovation of TRL, if you like, uh, in order to make sure that uh, the, 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 the stakeholders actually have a tool that would allow them to implement all this uh, approach in a consistent and sort of transparent manner, transparent in the sense of trying to also to address some of the ethical and philosophical <laughs> and philosophical issues that uh, we just uh, discussed uh, earlier. And of course, we need to be able to follow, and we have, we are already geared towards that, to follow the uh, OECD activities at the international level, and not only the OECD, of course, but uh, we have already uh, good conducts in this uh, process. Uh, one more slide, I think. Uh, so from that perspective, the idea is to actually move with uh, uh, actually synerg uh, creating synergies with ongoing activities. The chemical strategy for sustainability and its implementation actions action plan is a key one. Um, the European Platform on uh, Life Cycle Assessment, the OECD guidance on uh, considerations for identification and selection of safer chemical alternatives, but also the European Technology Platform for Sustainable Chemistry. Um, in this sense, uh, actually, here you can actually see already the very clear technical support that the uh, part is supposed to uh, deliver in terms of implementation of uh, the SSBD criteria. And there's a number of, uh, of uh, low-hanging fruit uh, the strong focus on uh, lessons learned from SBD and uh, sustainable by, by design projects like the ones on nanomaterials. In this case, the nano safety cluster and Sabidoma itself actually are of very high pertinence. Um, to actually check the effectiveness and the scalability of the methodology and toolbox developing part on nano, I think that's a very nice synergy that we can actually already start thinking about uh, early on. Uh, but also to identify the connection with the, the new uh, IRIS project, uh, it's a co co coordinated support action uh, that is there to, to sort of create a network that would support the, the uh, implementation of this criteria um, run by the European Commission. So uh, again, here the idea is to actually create a, a, a web of connections, of, of, of the connections among both stakeholders and projects and processes. Um, to make sure that uh, we all move together in this uh, direction. I understand that there may be differences in, in, in you know, perspective, uh, but uh, I'm fully convinced that uh, this can become a real uh, game changer and a win-win situation and not a business as usual uh, kind of process, uh, but it's up to us to make this come true. Uh, I think I had one more slide, but because here the idea is to actually create uh, do as much less mistakes as we can, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, Bertolt Brecht put in uh, Galileo's uh, lips in his uh, work on life of, on the life of Galileo, uh, where he is actually talking about uh, uh, the main objective of science. I think this is what we're trying to serve here in this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Denis, for your nice talk. And now we welcome Jana Turvolabova. I hope, Jana, it was well pronounced. Uh, she's a second national expert in the European Commission, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> and hello, friends. Uh, I would like to thank organizers for um, making this nice workshop and also to other speakers because we already heard lots of interesting ideas um, next slide please you know um, dennis already said that uh, uh, we need a holistic approach which encompass many different aspects and now uh, you are aware that there are lots of ongoing activities on safe and sustainable by design starting for example with jrc on developing criteria and framework for ssbd there was a recently OECD workshop and, and so on. So uh, we need to um, be sure that we are not talking only about chemicals and materials, but also about products, as uh, Dennis already said. Uh, you might see the funny video um, with uh, chemicals on scene list, uh, where is the 
nice quote, don't let uh, hazardous chemicals uh, ruin your product. And when I looked at SCIP database of ECA, I was, uh, I was shocked that uh, the, this database is uh, already listing over 7 million of uh, articles and products containing uh, substances of very high concern. And this is definitely not cool and this is definitely not sustainable. So we don't want to go this way. That's why I always remember what, uh, what uh, my guru of Nano told me, safety first, second and third. <laughs> So uh, we need to think about long term safety and sustainability and consider the whole life cycle. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and now we need to ask what tools do we need to achieve uh, this SSBD? As we know, this is very complex, covering different stages such as processing, uh, safety and environmental impact assessment, recycling, but also the functionality and uh, we need uh, improved tools and methods to address uh, missing data for instance and in extrapolating and upscaling with advanced technologies uh, which means advanced uh, tools for physical chemical characterization and advanced uh, tools for modeling and simulation which covers different models and again we are not talking only about chemicals um, single chemicals but also about their mixtures and about secondary raw materials because we also need to think about circularity. Next slide, please. So we are aware that there is a big knowledge gap and lots of technological and scientific challenges which we need to uh, consider. Um, by integration of different aspects, namely social, economical and environmental of life cycle assessment and also integration of uh, LCA with risk assessment. Like this, we will be able to cover uh, sustainable production, consumption and also end of life. And uh, for this, we need to develop uh, mainly impact indicators and also uh, SSBD toolbox. Uh, which uh, which will allow to uh, share the data uh, with uh, lots of stakeholders and also SMEs and uh, it will also develop uh, guidelines with uh, illustrated case studies and last but not least um, sharing best practices and um, regulatory preparedness this is also very important next slide please and I would like to conclude uh, that uh, SSBD chemicals and materials uh, have the potential to contribute to a new application of advanced materials uh, within the innovation markets identified in a manifesto for materials, uh, which was published on 7 February and acknowledged by uh, Commissioner Gabriel. And uh, as you can see, this uh, advanced uh, materials within these innovation uh, markets are cross-cutting and uh, practically everywhere is sustainability but we also need to uh, cover safety uh, the document is currently available on our website i shared the link here and uh, with this i would like to thank you for your attention thank you Jana, for your perspective and now we continue with Xenia Tria. Um, with her background in science and advisory, she is currently working as an expert on chemicals, environment and human health at the European Environment Agency. Um, unfortunately, she has not been able to attend today here, but she has sent a pre-recorded presentation. Hello, my name is Sinia Trier and I'm from the European Environment Agency. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting us to present the EA vision for safe and sustainable by design. Our vision is very much close to the chemical strategy for sustainability and it's called for a more preventative approach whereby you prevent problems rather than trying to solve them, for instance, pollution after it has been created. It also calls for ensuring a green transition across multiple parameters and for instance, avoiding climate change and biodiversity loss 
and reducing pollution and achieving circularity and non-toxic material cycles at the same time. But let's have a close look at what safe and sustainable biosign is. Well, SSPD is a multidisciplinary design of a product which is applied by industry. It starts out considering the service of the product. So what is the service that a product should deliver? For instance, protection against water. Do you use an umbrella? Do you have a raincoat that is coated with a chemical coating? Or do you have uh, some physical coating on it? These are different types of services. Of course, you also have to think about what the technical performance should be. It should be fit for purpose and not overperforming. What is the chemical function and how can you make it circular by design? In the process, we think it's very important that you avoid using chemicals of concern. And by that, we mean um, the substances of concern, which is different from just the substances of very high concern. So it's actually more uh, preventative. After having gone through these considerations, you can select the candidates and then you can start describing their life cycles, which raw materials are used, what is the production like, what is the use and what is the waste and reuse. And that allows you to estimate, for instance, pollution emitted along these life cycles. It gives you an overview of the life cycle impacts and thereby you can start assessing the impacts. And here we think you should assess the resource use, the safety to human health, what are the ecosystem impacts and what are the climate impacts? You then move into like assessing the candidates by comparing it with uh, safe and sustainable by design criteria. And finally, you have a total score which allows you to select the best candidate to produce, at least according to environmental um, criteria. But let's have a closer look at how you can compare with SSPD criteria. First of all, we think it's very important that a product should deliver um, protection to the environment across all four parameters at the same time. We therefore think it's important to set minimum scores so you don't have a product which is, has a very high score in one of the parameters but very low in another one, which actually means that it, it could be um, accused of being greenwashing. This can happen if you, for instance, have a climate change technology um, which gives very low greenhouse gas emissions, but uses very toxic chemicals and thereby cause pollution. We therefore think to create trustworthiness in SSPD, you need to set these minimum scores. You might also want to set maximum scores because then in the end, when you sum the, the scores across the four parameters or protection goals, you will end up with something which is weighed in a way. You could also just apply weighing factors here. But this is very much similar to like when you have a job candidate where the candidate has to uh, have um, performance across multiple um, yeah, multiple skills and the you can only achieve you have to achieve minimum points in one skill, but you can only achieve maximum points also in that skill. And then finally, you have the total scoring. You can start seeing if it's a if it's a very uh, poorly performing uh, and adequate performing or very high performing uh, product. But to achieve all this, you also need an enabling environment. Here we think it's important to have policies across research, chemicals, products and investment. And we are very happy to see that the SSPD has entered the sustainable finance criteria. You also mean need to have education. Um, in place for not just chemists, but also material engineers, designers and supply chain, everybody involved in this multidisciplinary design process. And finally, we think it's important to have technical support centers that can support industry with standardized documentation and compliance. And for that, you need to develop com compliance methods. And with that, we hope that we can see an industrial transition to safe and sustainable by design in Europe. And thank you very much for your attention. Have a good day. I'm Chloe De Vick, is a Senior Innovation Manager in the European Chemical Industry Council, CEFIC in Brussels, responsible for innovation policies and funding opportunities. Please, um, Chloe, you can begin. Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have a bit of a voice problem, but I hope you can uh, <clears throat> understand me correctly. Um, 
I'm really glad uh, to to give this presentation after all what was said before, because it really uh, gives me um, uh, reassurance that we are all on the same board, basically. Uh, so what, what um, I'm going to do is present you uh, the vision and the uh, what the chemical industry is actually working on at the moment on this uh, SSBD concept. And the first uh, slide you can see is uh, very um, in line with what um, uh, EA before uh, me uh, presented, so I'm really glad about this. So the, the first is the vision towards a toxic-free environment. And um, really, we are working uh, in, in together uh, on the reform of REACH on the regulation side, which is REACH, what we call REACH 2.0. And then on the safe and sustainable by design concept, which is really encouraging innovation and developing uh, safe and sustainable by design products, uh, materials, processes, uh, services, etc. Uh, next, please. So basically how we define, uh, when I say we define CEFIC, we have worked uh, in the last, uh, I would say, two years uh, with experts from uh, many, many uh, chemical companies on this. Uh, so we've worked on definition and how we visualize, how vision, how we vision the uh, safe and sustainable by design concept. Uh, so we uh, think it's a process to innovate. So it's really uh, innovation focused. And this is also about market. Of course, uh, we want to um, sell chemicals, materials, products and technologies, but which are safe and deliver environmental, societal and or economical value through their applications. So here applications is important because we have to look through the whole value chain of all uh, products. And the chemical industry obviously is uh, somewhere upstream in the, in the value chains. And this would enable accelerating the transition towards a secular economy and climate neutral society. Because some, something which is um, often forgotten is that the chemicals or yeah, the materials we develop are, here, are there to enable the uh, transition, basically, secular economy and climate neutral society uh, as, as the main pillars, basically. And of course, e enabling uh, preventing, preventing harm to uh, human health and the environment throughout the life cycle. Uh, next, please. So there you have what what is our thinking. So the, the chemical industry, uh, basically, we don't want to compromise on chemical safety. Uh, we, we want to have transparent uh, assessments. Uh, we are uh, thinking of uh, implementing guidelines on the innovation side. We are also uh, looking to innovate for alternative chemicals. And also we think we have to differentiate different uh, uses. Obviously, uh, we, ha we might have to differentiate um, on essential uses. Um, and again uh, multi criteria decisions that i will detail a bit more after and thinking that we have many different sustainability dimensions here along the chemical safety we have uh, sustainability dimensions um circular economy is a very strong pillar for us in the chemical industry and everything is rooted in in science obviously um, and the life cycle approach is still uh, completely valid. It's just that we have to uh, put together with the life cycle uh, many other dimensions all together in a holistic approach, as it has uh, mentioned, uh, at is at, as it has been mentioned several times by the previous speakers. Uh, next, please. So here you can see the exercise that we did on the different criteria that we think should be part of the safe and sustainable by design. So, okay, 
you have the environmental criteria that we all know about, uh, the carbon footprint, water footprint, uh, pollution prevention and control, uh, biodegradability, um, human toxicity, obviously, but this is the blue part of this uh, circle. But then you have the social criteria, and that was also mentioned before, uh, well-being, uh, employment, um, basic rights and needs, um, skills and knowledge, all of this need, need to be part of safe, safe and sustainable by design. And we should not um, exclude anything about market. So market-related criteria is about value chain collaborations, uh, product performance, because this is obvious, we are looking for functionalities. When I said we look to be able to recycle products, uh, this is about product performance. We want to develop a product which needs to be uh, recyclable. Um, this is it. Um, next, please. So we're just like trying to make a summary of all this. Uh, we, we support ourselves on the sustainable de development goals on a global level. And then um, here you can see our vision again towards a toxic free environment. The circular economy that would for us is a very, very important pillar. Uh, and this is it, uh, safe and sustainable by design process to bring products and technologies to the market that are safe bring environmental, economic, and social value. So this is it, economic and social value. Uh, so this is completely holistic through their applications. And there we have to work all along uh, the different value chains. Next, please. Uh, so here um, you have uh, uh, examples of innovation principles. I mean, I like this example. I gave it to, uh, to the list of uh, I add it to the list of uh, different um, uh, references that we were asked to give. And even, of course, it's not like nanomaterials focused, it's, it's about uh, sustainable plastics, but uh, we thought it was a very, very good example of uh, developing a concept and uh, really uh, giving concrete examples of uh, safe and sustainable by design uh, plastics, basically. So this is showing examples of design principles, uh, examples of design goals, and examples of considerations during the manufacturing phase. So I invite you to, to look at this document because it gives a very good overview of all what needs to be taken in consideration in the uh, innovation process for safe and sustainable by design. Uh, next, please. I think I have finished my, uh, my presentation. Um, I just uh, would like to thank you. Uh, and uh, I, I have heard that the IRIS project was mentioned before. I wasn't sure because we are just in the phase of uh, uh, starting, but uh, uh, SUS the SUSCAM platform where CEFIC is, uh, is sitting is going to be part of this IRIS project. And we will be collaborating with the park uh, initiative, the park uh, partnership, and I think this this will be great um, as a, a, an example of uh, a full uh, stakeholders collaboration between public partners, um, uh, private partners, and uh, the full uh, stakeholders communities. Thank you. Sorry about my my voice. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your for your talk and for highlighting this uh, collaboration between different initiatives, associations, and organizations. And get well soon with your voice. Now we continue with um, Henry Gedin, uh, who is policy advisor at ChemSec, the International Chemical Secretariat, a non-profit NGO working with chemicals and circular economy. The floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to do a brief presentation of the ChemSec position on the safe and sustainable by design concept. Uh, and as you might know, ChemSec is a non-profit NGO that works 
uh, with um, closely together with companies, investors, and policymakers to improve the chemical legislation in Europe, and are therefore highly involved in in, in this work of of finding a good definition of safe and sustainable by design. And when we started this work, we we just tried to to found our foundation in, in the chemical strategy for sustainability that was presented two years ago by the Commission. And there, um, what, what are the general intentions of the Commission? What do they want to achieve? And what we can read there is, among other things, that, uh, that uh, substitution of most harmful substances has not occurred at the expected pace and front runners still encounter major economic and technical barriers. We can also read that new chemicals and materials must be inherently safe and sustainable from production to end of life. And so this, this is basically where we start our work with safe and sustainable by design. Uh, and our position is basically in three, <laughs> three basic steps can, can summarize it. And it's that safe should always mean safe. Safe and sustainable by design should drive substitution. It should create incentives for industry to move in the right direction. And that we should implement it now and do it stepwise. A lot can be done already today. So we can take the next slide, please. So what do we mean with the safe should mean safe? Yes, uh, it's of course that substances of concern can never be labeled safe um, because it would not improve the protection of human health and the environment. It would ultimately compromise trust in the market and decision makers if something that is uh, labeled safe and sustainable is actually not safe. Uh, and it would further on also create implications for the circular economy. Uh, and this is something that we see in, in a, when we have our dialogues with recycling companies, for example, um, that they are struggling with this, uh, not knowing exactly if, if the waste they are processing is actually safe. And we last year we presented the report where we conclude that billions of euros are lost in failed recycling just because of this. And, and, and so safe and that it, it is very important, um, both for our environment and also for our, our economy, that safe actually means safe. Next slide, please. Um, and as a driver for substitution, we don't think that safe and sustainable by design concept should be a minimum requirement for anything. We, we think that it could be created as a, uh, as a labeling system or a certification scheme uh, that pushes industry to move uh, above what they have previously performed. So it's not a minimum requirement, it's something that company, companies should strive towards. Uh, so we think this kind of labeling system could, could push the market and the industry into the right direction. Next slide, please. And the good news perhaps is that there are already today are a lot of data available. So uh, we think it's possible to implement it quite soon. Um, of course, we saw previously the, the slides from CEFIC. There are many, many sustainability parameters that we could take into consideration. And at the moment, we do not believe it's plausible to have them all working at once. We, we think we could start small and expand over time. And here it's important to have an open dialogue and and very be very clear and precise on how we proceed. Um, I think it would it's it's it would be a good idea to have a clear timetable of how we implement these different parameters. So we basically think that the safe and sustainable by design concept could be used as um, a certification scheme, a labeling system that creates incentives for industry to move away from. Uh, substances of concern and more and towards more sustainability uh, to summarize the chemsec position and with that i think my five minutes are up so thank you for your time thank you hendrik for your nice talk short but really coming to the point thanks a lot
then we continue with Blanca Suarez, who is working for Tema Solutions um, GmbH as a European project manager with a focus on safe by design, supporting her customers with the safe or their of their cutting edge materials and products and work further towards adapting current regulations to further regulatory demands. Thanks, Blanca, for joining us, and here is your presentation. Um, thank you very much, uh, Beatriz and the Savidoma project for inviting us um, to provide our views uh, from the consultant perspective. Um, um, actually, uh, after listening to all these presentations, I'm kind of happy that uh, we are aligned. So my presentation will be quite short because most of it was already mentioned. But can I have the next one, please, Beatriz? Um, so um, for us, as we have already seen uh, today, um, Safe by Design is more like a philosophy. Um, and it has been developed through many different projects. I, As far as I'm aware, the focus has been mainly in Europe. Uh, I'm very um, proud of it. I haven't seen any many initiatives from the rest of, of the world. And the idea, as it was mentioned, is to anticipate any uncertainties and risks which are associated with the uh, nanomaterials or advanced nanomaterials because in our view uh, nanomaterial the functionality of nanomaterials is what makes them attractive so at the same time functionality of nanomaterials may cause also concerns for harm or may not so this kind of uncertainties uh, were the main um, trigger in early projects um, to develop this kind of safe by design approaches and nowadays we are uh, also implementing implementing sustainability by design but i like to um, to give our perspective from the consultant because when companies come to us they they generally don't come to improve their nanomaterial but they they come um, for for um, they are interested in developing final products which contain nanomaterials and in this case we are struggling because the original nanomaterial the pristine nanomaterial is not the one that uh, will be transformed in the final product. So from our perspective, we need more information on what happens to these transformed materials and also the release of the potential material. Because as we have seen before from many presentations today, we do have a lot of information on pristine particles, but, but we are now facing the point of, of the final products. So this is a, an important point I'd like to address. Uh, we do have a lot of tools already. Now we are working in the harmless projects, developing more uh, another framework, uh, and we are really uh, benefiting very, very much from previous projects that were mentioned before by Eva uh, from the nano safety cluster. We have a lot of tools, and we want to bring this one level higher, like it was already mentioned by Sefik and others, because we want to take into account the different dimensions of sustainability, the social dimension, environmental, human health, and the economic dimension as well. And this is very important because we want to foster innovation and uh, there must be an incentive for companies. They, they, they must see the, the, the win to win situation here. Otherwise we, we will be um, aiming for, for European companies to be not competitive to those uh, from, from, the, from the other parts of, of the world. So we think the economic uh, dimension is also important as well. So together we like to take into account of these, these dimensions. And we are lacking really, I mean, we do have the tools in our view from a consultant perspective, we are lacking instructions on what to do, when to use what. So companies will, will have a um, proper guideline to follow. And I'm talking about small SMEs, those companies which need to outsource this kind of, of work. So, so there we also see, see an important gap as well. So if I can have the next one, Beatrice, please. So yeah, so generally when we're trying to implement this, implement this safe and sustainable by design frameworks, then we'll break down our uh, the pro production process into different phases. And now we are, we are focusing on three main ones, the business concept, the lab, lab scale, and the pilot scale. And in our um, experience, most of it has to be at the design um, concept because it's here is when we have more degrees of, of freedom. Once we go out on the line, there is much little we can do. So it's really important to focus in our perspective on those modeling tools, which are, are able to predict uh, consequences uh, down the line. And uh, yeah, with this, I will finish because I'm quite short. Um, I, most of it was already mentioned. I think it's more interesting to have a discussion later.
So thank you very much. Thanks, Blanca, for your nice presentation. And now we welcome our last speaker today, Jean Kelly, who is Senior Project Manager at the Nanotechnology Industries Association and is working on behalf of, of its members to support the development of nanotechnology innovations. Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the uh, the slight technical hitch there. Uh, I've been given the difficult task, I think, of closing everything. Uh, and so I want to try and bring us back to some sort of uh, practicalities here. What do we actually mean by safe and sustainable by design? And I think we've got three terms here that are always quite difficult to define. Safety, sustainability and design. And we can have lots of discussion around what we mean. Do we mean safe, safe for use? Do we mean safe, intrinsically safe? For sustainability, what do we mean? Do we mean sustainable in of itself or sustainable throughout the whole life cycle? Or do we mean that we can create products that can at least be recycled in some form? And of course, the challenging issue here, and one that I think that we've not really touched upon a lot so far, is this concept of what do we mean by design? And so as an overall concept, I think one of the things that we can agree is that safe, by sustainable, safe and sustainable by design is an attempt to almost identify decision points along a development process, which allows us to define what options we have moving forward. And of course, as people have already mentioned, we have to have this idea of balancing cost, safety and functionality, which is obviously crucial when we're looking to design a new nanomaterial or a nanomenable product. Next slide, please. And so looking at the sort of issues uh, that we're addressing, we have to think about the transition of materials across their own life cycle. So from the diagram on the left, which I know is not very clear on this slide, but you can look at it in the publication there that I've mentioned. We're looking at what a material goes through as it moves up the technology readiness levels. What are the decision points that we have there? But also we have to decide its passage through the supply chain what are the decision points there? So if we consider, for example, uh, a very simple supply chain here of a carbon nanotube being produced, made into then a composite, put into a car bumper, onto the car, and eventually an end of life scenario. We have to think, what are those decision points? And really importantly, who's actually making those decisions and what scope do they have? And one of the concepts I'd like to get across here is that from a nanomaterial production perspective, so talking about what we're doing when we're making the carbon nanotube, it's actually quite difficult for the carbon nanotube manufacturer to be able to think about those decisions throughout the whole life cycle. And so we have to make that process more transparent and easy for that to be able to happen. Because, of course, this is a very, what I've shown here is a very simple supply chain. But in actual fact, these supply chains are very complicated and often the person at one part of the supply chain does not necessarily have the ability to see what's happening at the other end of the supply chain. Next slide, please. So what do we have to do to make this all work? First of all, we have to ask certain questions. Do we have the right tools and the methods to actually deploy safe and sustainability by design and industry? Many of the tools that we're looking at require far too much data. They're not necessarily suitable for the early stage R&D. And this means that we're losing that by design element. So we have to do this at the design phase. And the challenge that we've certainly seen in a lot of the projects is can these tools actually be deployed without support? They need to be released into uh, the environment and allowed for people to be able to use them. This means that we have to make a lot of it simpler. It must be simpler to implement. If we create things that are, in, as Blanca said, very philosophical, then we make it more difficult for people to actually implement in a practical way. So we need better guidance. We need more standards and guidance that can be followed. We need to include in our projects more material scientists. They can, these can cover the early stage innovations. But also in a lot of the projects, what we've seen is a lack of, for example, process engineers looking at the production stage. This is what we need to be able to do to deploy safe and sustainable by design. We have to really simplify this and be able to explain how we get from an idea to a material to a product 
to its actual use and then the eventual end of life. And we have to be able to do this, as Blanca said, for SMEs as well as large scale companies. And finally, on the last point, how do we actually link safe and sustainability by design with regulatory compliance? And many people have mentioned about the sort of minimum the industry must do, which are obviously fulfilled with regulations, but we must also make sure that we're not too swift to introduce regulations that industry don't have the tools to be able to comply with. And we obviously, from an industrial perspective, what we want is for people to be able to uh, use safe and sustainable by design methodologies, but that means we must design them in a way that they can be used. And on that, I will finish. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jean, for closing the part of um, external speakers.